This technicality episode is brought to you by Brilliant.org. Hey guys, I'm here. Let's get technical. This is fire. It's the visible effect of a combustion reaction, which is a reaction between oxygen and some fuel source, releasing heat and various combustion byproducts. But what if I told you we didn't always think this? I mean, we have evidence that human-controlled fires have been around for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, and oxygen was only discovered in 1774, so surely we had to have some sort of robust explanation for fire before that date. We did. Introducing phlogiston, or the chemical we thought was the cause of fire before we knew what fire really was. Get ready to embark on the story of when science was wrong about fire for 100 years, and how the discovery of oxygen changed the way we think about chemistry. Our story begins with this guy, German chemist Johann Becher. Chapter 1 the origin of phlogiston. No one better captures where science was in the 17th century than Johann Becher. And by that, I mean he believed if he had the right materials, he could turn himself invisible. Alchemy was a large part of chemistry, and Betcher's theories reflected that. As he explained in his 1669 book, Physica Subterranea, Betcher believed everything was made out of some combination of three elements, earth, water, and air. Air, a term that encapsulated all gases, was the catalyst that allowed water and earth to mix and make all sorts of compounds. Earth itself was divided into three subgroups, terra lapida, or the vitrifiable earth, terra mercurialis, or the mercurial earth, and terra pingus, or the combustible earth. For a substance to be able to catch on fire, it had to contain terra pingus, which was released from that substance whilst ablaze. After it completely burned and all the terra pingus left, terra lapida would be what remained. 9000 IQ. Chapter 2 the creation of phlogiston. This is Georg Ernst Stahl, born in 1660. He fell in love with chemistry at a young age, and by the time he was 15, he was studying college-level chemistry lectures. By the time I was 15, I could successfully make Annie's mac and cheese. Well, depending on how you define successfully. Stahl built off Beecher's theories. He renamed Terra Pingus, the element behind fire, to phlogiston, from the Greek phlogos, or flame. Phlogiston was born. Instantly, Stahl was passionate about expanding the phlogiston theory. Phlogiston wasn't necessarily fire itself, per se, but rather the element that was lost during combustion. The flame itself was merely the twirling motion created by the liberation of phlogiston. Phlogiston is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Kind of like iocane powder. I smell nothing. What you do not smell is called iocane powder. It is odorless, tasteless, dissolves instantly in liquid, and is among the more deadly poisons known to man. Huh. A substance infused with phlogiston is phlogisticated, and after it's burned and all of the phlogiston is released into the atmosphere, it's dephlogisticated. By that logic, the ash of a substance, known as a calx of that substance, is its true form, because it doesn't have any of that pesky phlogiston in it. Once phlogiston is released into the atmosphere, it's responsible for stuff like lightning, and can be found in every corner of the earth. From clouds, to rain, to plants soaking up that rain, to animals eating those plants. There is a phlogiston cycle, just like the water cycle or the carbon cycle. The proper the properties of phlogiston are a bit different depending on if a certain substance falls into the natural world, like animals or plants, or the mineral and metal world. For the natural world, the removal of phlogiston is irreversible. Once you burn a leaf, say, you can't inject phlogiston back into that leaf and unburn it. But you can with metals, thus giving rise to this chemical equation. Metal is calx plus phlogiston. So zinc, for example, is actually made up of calx of zinc and phlogiston. And you can make regular old zinc by combining burned zinc with phlogisticated air or another phlogiston-rich substance, like oil. You might be thinking that this sounds absolutely absurd, but Stahl's theory of phlogiston caught on pretty quickly. Because frankly, it fit. Not only was it the first consistent theory to explain combustion, or really any chemical reaction in general, it fit with everything we knew about chemistry in the 1600s. Phlogiston would come to be the reigning theory of combustion for the next century, but that doesn't mean it was without skepticism. Chapter 3 the problems with phlogiston. Your mystery solving skills don't have to be as good as Shaggy's to deduce there are a fair amount of flaws with the theory of phlogiston. Let's take a look at two of its biggest flaws and how phlogiston supporters responded to them. The first problem? When a metal is burned, it actually gains mass. This is because at high temperatures, metals combine with surrounding oxygen to form oxides, which are just compounds that involve oxygen. Wait a second! Nani? If phlogiston is supposed to be released during combustion, then the original substance should be getting lighter, not heavier. After all, it is losing something. <sighs> well, don't worry folks, I've got three different people with three different explanations, so one of them has got to be correct. Right? Louise Bernard Guyton de Mauvois, a French chemist whose name I just butchered, proposed phlogiston was lighter than air itself, and actually pulled objects up, much like how a helium balloon floats. Friedrich Albert Karl Gren, a German chemist, thought gravity didn't even interact with phlogiston at all. 
Gravity just took one look and was like, nah, this ain't for me, chief. The final explanation for this, and probably the one closest to our current understanding of this phenomenon, comes from German chemist Johann Heinrich Pott. He was the student of one of Stahl's students. So you could call him Stahl's grand student humor! Grab Ray will never be a dead meme, don't at me. Pot predicted that during the deflogistication of a metal, heavy particles of air would get trapped inside that metal and increase its weight. The second problem? Check this out. If I light this candle, and then I put it, press F to pay respects. If I light this candle, and then put it in an enclosed space like such, the candle goes out after just a couple seconds. Whack. We know why this happens now. Fire needs oxygen to burn, and once it's all used up, it can't burn anymore. But how do you explain this under the phlogiston theory? Oh, my bad. Sorry, of course. Phlogiston must be carried away from the thing that's burning by air. That's why fire doesn't work in a vacuum. And a certain amount of air can only hold so much phlogiston. Perfectly understandable. Have a nice day. More and more evidence against phlogiston began to stack up, which is what makes this whole story really fascinating. Even when presented with so much contradictory evidence, most people didn't conclude the theory was incorrect, but rather kept slightly modifying it to the point where the theory itself even became contradictory just so they could preserve their worldview. Hmm. So what was the tipping point? What finally caused the theory to fall? Well, to learn about that, we actually have to learn about a big supporter of phlogiston, Joseph Priestley. Chapter 4. The Death of Phlogiston. You have Joseph Priestley to thank every time you crack open a Coke with the boys, because he invented soda water, and his work with gases didn't stop there. In 1773, he did that same cup experiment we just did, but threw a mouse in the cup while he was at it. Priestley noticed that after the flame went out, the mouse would die from suffocation. But when he put a mouse and a plant next to a window with sunlight in that cup with the flame, must have been a big cup, the mouse was just fine. In that moment, Priestley discovered photosynthesis but he didn't know what photosynthesis was, so he didn't think much of it and moved on with his experiments. In 1774, he conducted a similar experiment with a mouse in a jar, but this time he used a foot-long lens to direct sunlight onto a lump of mercuric oxide inside the jar. He realized that the gas the lump gave off would heat it up could keep the mouse alive for around four times longer than if he had just left the mouse in the cup alone. He realized that air isn't an element itself. Rather, it's made up of many elements, and by heating up mercuric oxide, he just isolated one of them, never isolated or even known of before. Oxygen. But can you make Annie's mac and cheese? I bet not. I can do that, just saying. Priestley, however, didn't know this. He was in uncharted territory, so he thought he had just discovered deflogisticated air, and was quite pleased by himself at that. He wrote it was five or six times as good as regular air, whatever that means, and said, quote, The feeling of it in my lungs was not sensibly different from that of common air, but I fancied that my breast felt particularly light and easy for some time afterwards. Who can tell but that in time, this pure air may become a fashionable article in luxury. My man's Jojo Priestley out here predicting that pure oxygen will one they become a hype beast item. Can you imagine if that was true? Yo, you see the new Supreme drop? Yeah, man, I copped that Supreme X 02. I hear it's going for a quadruple on stock X. Oh, and uh, in case this needs to be said, don't breathe in pure oxygen. It's really not good for you. <laughs> that's, it. that's its actual slogan. Pure oxygen. It's really not good for you. Priestley was so hyped about his discovery of deflogisticated air, he hit up his boy Antoine Lavoisier. Lavoisier is a level 35 mafia boss. He's done so much to contribute to science, he's known as the father of modern chemistry. Among other things, he pioneered the metric system and the fact that elements like we know them today exist. He published the first ever chemistry textbook, which is entitled Long French Name, which I'm going to mispronounce, entitled Traité Elementaire de Chimie, which included what came to be known as the law of conservation of mass, the concept that mass can't be created or destroyed destroyed, yet another thing Lavoisier discovered. In the early 1770s, Lavoisier and his team were studying combustion, looking for an explanation to a dilemma we discussed earlier. When metals burn, they gain weight. He correctly hypothesized that it was air that was interacting with these metals and causing these weight changes, so he focused all of his and his team's research around that. In 1774, Lavoisier was doing lots of experiments, but just couldn't get that final piece to oxygen. Meanwhile, Priestley decided to bop over to Paris and invited Lavoisier to a dinner held in his honor at the Academy of Sciences. The two bros were big fans of each other's work, so they chatted about what they were working on. Ayo, hey, Lavoise, what's up, my man? Oh, nothing much, Elvis Priestley. What? That joke will make sense in 200 years. Ah, okay. So what have you been up to? Okay, so I discovered this cool new thing called deflogisticated air. It's like pure air. It's amazing. You get it by heating up mercuric oxide, except it's not called mercuric oxide because we don't know what oxides are yet. 
Oh my god, I, I gotta go. What? I gotta go! That dinner changed everything. Lavoisier dashed back to his lab, did Priestley's experiment, and named this new gas the Greek for acid maker. Oxygen. In 1775, Lavoisier presented his findings to the French Academy of Science, which put the nail in Phlogiston's coffin. Lavoisier, along with some of his colleagues, would go on to publish Methode de Nomenclature Chimique in 1787, which got rid of the old system of four elements, earth, water, air, and phlogiston, and replaced them with 55 new ones, including the new and neat oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, and others. The kicker? Priestley stood by his theory of dephlogisticated air until the day he died and refused to accept oxygen and the rest of the chemical revolution that would follow. As a result, he was disgraced from the scientific community. I love the story of phlogiston, because even though phlogiston doesn't exist, it's still applicable to our everyday lives. It's a reminder that sometimes we're wrong, and the best way to learn and get closer to the truth is to prove ourselves wrong. It's kind of funny that Georg Stahl, the dude behind the wildly popular yet inaccurate phlogiston theory, wrote that his personal motto was this, which roughly translates to, where there is doubt, whatever the greatest mass of opinion maintains is wrong. Huh. The more you're wrong, the more you grow. Embrace that. A great way you can fuel your passion for learning and growing from being wrong is through Brilliant.org, the perfect place to learn math, science, or computer science. I learned about Brilliant.org a little over a year ago and instantly fell in love with them because they actually helped me understand difficult concepts at a deep level. No bamboozle, I actually used this page from Brilliant.org to help me out in my environmental science class last semester. One really cool thing about Brilliant.org is their daily problems feature. Every day when you have a free five minutes and want to use it to learn something new, you can just check out some of Brilliant's curated puzzles on everything from how prehistoric humans track time Time to how to cut a Mobius strip in half. They're honestly mind-blowing. If you want to get in on these puzzles and so much more, you can sign up to Brilliant for free today and help out technicality by going to brilliant.org slash technicality. Plus, the first 200 people to use that link get 20% off a premium subscription so you can view all the daily problems in the archives and unlock dozens of courses. Thanks, everybody. I put a ton of work into these videos. This one took around 40 to 50 hours to make, so if you liked it, it's really helpful if you click that like button and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. If you want to check out some more of my videos on natural science, I recommend my video on the lightning frost effect or these really cool beads that become invisible underwater. Also, my Hamilton video is like this close to a million views, which is utterly mind-blowing. So if you want to check that out, that's on screen too. Thanks to my patrons at patreon.com slash technicality, especially these super awesome people on screen right now. Thanks for watching DFTBA and explore on. Boom.